Okay, great. Yeah. So I, I guess just one quick comment is I did some a similar organization during my undergrad. So it's really exciting to see people do the same thing here and to hear about all the cool projects going on. So uh, today I'll be talking about multi-rate VAE, which um, we published at iClear. And I'll talk a little bit more about, I guess, some of the motivation for the work throughout this presentation. And if you have questions at any time, feel free to interrupt and I'll pause a couple of times through the presentation. Um, okay, so the main idea here is, uh, I, I guess we'll, we'll start with some background. So originally the motivation comes from autoencoders, which if you're not familiar with, the goal of an autoencoder is to learn a latent representation, which is smaller than the original sized input, which captures key features of the input. So in an example with MNIST digits, we're trying to reconstruct a four, but we have this intermediate bottleneck layer, which is much lower dimension. No. And this is a standard autoencoder. Typically, we have multiple layers of uh, a neural network that encode the input into this bottleneck, and then we decode the output afterwards. So one uh, tweak we often make to the autoencoder is we also want to enforce a constraint on this latent variable z to make it more meaningful, meaning um, currently there's no constraint at all on z, and it can just be any uh, d-dimensional vector. But if we constrain it instead to be similar to a vector sampled from something like a Gaussian distribution, this gives us some more structure in this latent space. And one key advantage of that is it turns this autoencoder into a generative model, meaning uh, to generate a new example, we can just sample from our latent variable and then run it through a decoder, and that gives us a new generated output. So that's the standard structure of the variational autoencoder. And um, essentially now there are two losses. So there's this original loss, which is the same as what you um, typically see with the autoencoder where we try to reconstruct the input to be as close to the input as possible while also reducing its dimensionality. And then there's the second term known as the KL divergence term where we typically constrain our um, latent variable distribution to be as close to a Gaussian distribution as possible. And one really popular framework for um, training list VAEs is, uh, um, there's a question. Okay, never mind. So uh, one typical framework is to use the beta VAE objective, where beta is some positive constant that trades off between these two terms. So a greater beta would put more emphasis on the second term. And yeah, so this is a beta VAE objective, and it's commonly used in a lot of text and image generative models. So uh, one problem with this approach, though, is that to train for a given beta value, you have to reinitialize your network and train from scratch with this objective. And uh, it's not clear a priori on a new task what beta value to choose. So. The standard VAE chooses a beta value of one, which we denote with the star here. And various different values of beta will result in different um, values on what we call the rate distortion curve, which is essentially like how well you do on the two different losses. So on the left here, you see um, various trade-offs and these correspond to training from scratch with different values of beta. And on the right here, um, this is from the Celeb A data set, which is a data set of celebrity faces you can see what the generated outputs look like for various values of beta. So we get various trade-offs and the typical way we describe these trade-offs is if we have a low distortion value, that usually means we can reconstruct the data points well, but oftentimes the data points that we generate from scratch are unrealistic. Whereas um, on the other extreme, if you have a low rate, that means the variational distributions may be close to the prior, but we may not have actually encoded useful information to meaningfully reconstruct the data. So this is a challenging problem, and typically tuning the KL weight beta depends on every application independently. Okay, so that's the motivation for the problem. Let's see if there's questions. I don't think there's any so far, so we'll move along. 
Um, uh, some additional background information is we'll now describe the idea of a response function. So the response function is what something that maps from a KL weight beta to the optimal encoder and decoder parameter parameters that minimize the beta VAE objective. So you should think of this as we train to completion with a given value of beta, and that gives us a variational autoencoder. And we're trying to learn this mapping from this uh, single beta to this high dimensional space that encodes like uh, the optimal parameters for that data. So this is sort of the objective that we're actually trying to learn in our new framework. Pictorially, it might be a little bit more clear what's going on. So for each of the values beta, we get a loss surface corresponding to, I guess, uh, each of these dimensions where the loss surface represents the weights of the encoder and decoder. And uh, we're projecting into a lower dimensional subspace. And you can see there is a particular value that minimizes the loss for that given value of beta. And this value uh, changes as we vary the value of beta. So the idea of the response function is we want to map uh, from beta to this, to this uh, projection that uh, essentially slices through different values of beta. So rather than training from scratch, we want to ideally be able to learn this red curve here. And our goal is to do this in a single training run. So that's the key intuition behind our paper. Like we have all these different beta parameterized losses. Can we try to learn this in a single network? So the way we approach this is we parameterize something known as a hyper network, where it's a small modification of a normal standard network, where the standard network we refer to as the base parameters. And essentially what we're doing is for each layer, we also have some hyperparameter condition layers, uh, which scale the base layer. So the idea is the uh, these hyper layers take in our value of beta, and then they tell you how we should modulate the base layers to produce the desired response function. So in equ equation form, um, we take a log of the beta because beta is typically sampled from a log uniform space. So if you sample beta uniformly, you got to take the log. And then uh, you perform a linear transformation and apply an affine function. Then you uh, row-wise scale the base weights or um, element-wise scale the, the bias term. And uh, this is like our modification to the standard base network. Another way to think about this is if you write it out in equation form, normally you have um, the next pre-activation is equal to the weight times the current activation plus the bias. What we're doing here is we can actually decompose this into the product of two terms. So you have the base network, which is fixed across every single beta. And then depending on the sort of beta objective that we're trying to minimize, we have um, we apply this transformation, which applies like a gating. So we're basically gating each layer based on the beta that we're trying to optimize. The picture form of this equation is um, this applies to every layer. And what we're doing is normally you have your input x, it goes through your layer and it generates some output. What we're doing now is for this output, we're applying this element wise gating. It's sort of similar to what you might do in an LSTM, where the gating is factor is determined by the transformation of the beta term. So essentially, this gives the null. This gives knowledge to the base network of what hyperparameter and what objective we're trying to tune. And the advantage of this approach is it's only a small addition, additional number of parameters. It's roughly 3 to 5% to represent response functions on many VAE architectures. And the reason we motivate, we're motivated to choose this type of um, parameterization is if you um, study the linear case, you can actually show this can exactly represent the optimal response function in linear VAEs. And we, we show through our experiments that it's actually pretty good for um, more complicated architectures and tasks as well. Any questions here? Okay, let's uh, keep going. So uh, this table essentially shows like how many parameters the base standard network has versus our Mr. VAE architecture. And you can see 
the increase in the number of parameters is relatively small. So we can uh, obtain this potentially expressive architecture with only a very small number of additional parameters. Okay, so next I'll describe our training objective. So we have this architecture, but it's not able to actually learn anything unless we define an algorithm for how to train this architecture. But uh, the procedure isn't actually too challenging. So the key difference between um, training a Mr. VAE versus training a standard VAE is now we are trying to minimize this expected loss where we're, the expectation is over the choice of beta you're sampling. So our goal is to uh, minimize expect, uh, like sampling from this log uniform space um, was loss across all different beta objectives. And this is analogous to what's used in self-tuning networks, if you're familiar with that. So the actual modification to the algorithm is actually very minimal. So the red parts are the augmented parts. So as usual, you would sample random mini batch. And the difference here is you also need to sample from your um, hyper, net, hyper parameter sweep space. So we sample a beta term, essentially. And then this beta determines the loss for each of the examples in our mini batch. So actually, during our forward pass, we can choose a different loss function for each of the individual betas. And it also determines how we condition our hyper network. So once you do that, you can actually calculate the loss um, given the current parameters. And then backpropagation actually just works uh, very naturally. So it's going to backprop to the base parameters. And it's also going to tell you how you should update the hyper network parameters to um, best modulate the network. And then we take our gradient update as usual. So it's a very minimal change to the typical algorithm you use for training hyper networks. Uh, so sorry, for training standard networks. And uh, that's our algorithm. OK, so we'll now describe some results. Uh, so here we show the standard rate distortion curves, as you've seen before. And our comparison is sort of to training a lot of different beta VAEs with different betas. And this corresponds to um, these triangles, which are upside down here. And you get various different values on the rate distortion curve. One thing with beta VAEs, though, you oftentimes actually need to do some sort of scheduling on the KL terms as well. So uh, we show that in the upright triangles. And then the red curve, which is actually a continuous curve, shows the results of our Mr. VAE algorithm. And one key advantage of our algorithm is actually you only get eight points here because you've only done eight runs, but you can actually plug in any value of beta because we're sampling from this continuous space and actually just gives you different um, trade-offs on this rate distortion curve. So you can see um, the parameter count uh, training eight beta VAEs is eight times the original parameters, but we have a very small increase and the training time is slightly increased because we, um, we have some more parameters we have to do back prop through. And we also get an entire rate distortion curve rather than just points along the curve. So this really has a lot of advantages over training uh, a lot of different beta VAEs from scratch. And you can do this same experiment across a lot of different tasks. So we show results on um, various different benchmarks with uh, image and text data. And we also scale up to NVAEs, which are a recent um, architecture that generates pretty high quality samples. So this basically shows that we have an efficient algorithm now to like rather than training from scratch and then uh, repeating this many times to get your best beta VAE, you can just train this Mr. VAE architecture once and then after you've trained, you can just pick whichever beta you want best. And the way you pick that beta um, can be based on like the quality of the generated samples, for instance. So on the left, you see um, examples generated by beta VAEs trained from scratch. On the right, you can see the results of our algorithm and how the quality varies across different betas. So one interesting thing to note is that if you're training from scratch, there's no similarity between the different betas. Like the latent space doesn't have this property that we have here, where if we use the same hidden latent vector, we actually get uh, semantically really similar outputs in the generated space. So for a given image, you can sort of 
changed its sharpness or its contrast just by um, choosing a latent vector and then tweaking the value of beta. So these are results on slab A, and this is like the street house numbers data set. Um, if you have some other downstream objective you want to tune, you can also do less, do that as well. So um, sometimes people care about metrics such as the FID score, and you can tune that just by plugging in different values of beta and then getting the value of your metric out. Finally, uh, one nice property is that we do have to specify our sampling range, like where we're sampling our values of beta. And we show in our experiments that we're robust to this choice of sampling range. So um, a, if A is a lower bound and B is upper bound, we run experiments where we either fix A and uh, vary B or fix B and vary A. And you can see that the resulting rate distortion curves tend to overlap. So there's not too much um, like meta hyperparameter tuning you have to do by uh, choosing how to specify A and B. Okay, yeah, so that's basically the results of our paper and some experiment details. I guess I'll, I'll just end by saying like, this wasn't the original direction of our project. Like we initially were just trying to uh, tackle like a family of different tasks and we we're trying to do this Pareto frontier sort of approach where you want to get as best as you can on two different metrics. But it turns out that it seems to be slightly easier to tackle if you actually have two objectives that are slightly competing. So in this case, the two losses, they're sort of in conflict with each other, which makes it a better sort of problem to tackle with this hyper-network based approach. And we've been lately working on trying to generalize this to um, just standard supervised learning as well. So you can try to tune hyperparameters with such as like dropout or L2 regularization without um, like training a bunch of times from scratch as well. So I think that's an exciting direction for future work, like figuring out um, where you have objectives which are conflicting or mutually um, like, uh, like they share some similarity, but there's some conflict between them and then trying to apply this sort of framework. Thanks for listening. Okay, so one of the questions in the chat is what are the downsides of this approach? Um, I think if you, you're scaling to a very large data set, it might be the case that our architecture isn't expressive enough to capture like all the intricacies. So like our rate distortion curve might be slightly shifted from the optimal rate distortion curve. But um, on the sizes of the data sets that we studied, like on this slide, it seems to generally be as good as training a bunch of networks from scratch or um, better. So I, I guess you can see like this triangle here, this isn't a point we can necessarily obtain. So you can do slightly better sometimes from by training from scratch. There's another question, which is, are there specific data types where this approach is less effective? Um, I think, I, I guess on the project we're working on right now, where we're trying to tackle general, more general problems, one thing we've noticed is it sort of depends on your choice of architecture. Like currently um, with our setup right now, we're applying it after essentially every layer, but depending on whether you're using like self-attention um, mechanisms, you might, it's not as clear where you want to insert your hyper layers. So there might be various trade-offs depending on the architecture you're using. Um, on the all the image tasks though, uh, it seems to work pretty well. Okay, another question is, does it mean that it's also hard to tweak the latent vector and potentially get a semantically similar but visually different output, such as a face? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I, I guess one way to tweak the latent vector is you can actually encode a image that's similar to the one you want to generate, and that gives you a latent vector you want to sample from. 
And because the latent space is somewhat meaningful, you can potentially apply some small amount of noise to that random vector and then regenerate. And that's one potential algorithm for generating similar inputs. But it might be the case that you might want to use a completely different paradigm, like VAEs might not be the best approach if you're just trying to generate semantically similar outputs. I'm guessing there's no more questions then thank you so much michael for the presentation and your time to join us today um, we really appreciate um, you spending time with us listening to the presentations of other projects hopefully it was enjoyable and uh, once again thank you for your presentation of course yeah thanks everyone